Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. All right, welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter 18, Solid and Hazardous Waste. We're going to move into now and, and begin to really talk about uh, those uh, four R's that we uh, that we spoke about uh, in, in the previous part here. Why are refusing, reducing, reusing, and recycling so important? Well, the benefits of reusing, reducing, uh, refusing, excuse me, reducing, reusing, and recycling is that it decreases the consumption of matter and energy resources. It also reduces pollution and natural capital degradation. And of course, it saves money. So these are your uh, reasons why uh, refusing, reducing, reusing, and recycling, again, the four R's, are so very important to us. So uh, alternatives to a throwaway economy, again, today's industrialized societies have substituted throwaway items for reusable ones. And that's what we're trying to do here. So questions you need to ask yourself if you want to reduce consumption. Do I really need this? How many of these do I really need? Is this something I can use more than once? And can I repurpose this project when I am done with it? So again, uh, something I think about all the time are those plastic water bottles, right? Uh, do you really need a, a plastic water bottle from Aquafina or from Poland Spring? Or, or, or can you uh, use some kind of thermos or some kind of permanent uh, water bottle, something like this, okay, that you can reuse over and over again? In addition, plastic water bottles, definitely something you could use more than once, right? You don't have to throw it out. You can use it two or three times, fill up your water, uh, et cetera. So these are kind of the questions you, you, you think about uh, when you ask yourself how to uh, reduce consumption. And again, that's the key uh, to uh, a throwaway uh, economy, or at least an alternative to a throwaway economy. We don't want to just go cradle to grave, right? We want to try to do more of that cradle to cradle approach, which we spoke about in part one. And we're actually going to speak about a little bit more coming up a little later here in part two. So again, just some questions. What can you do? Solid waste. Uh, follow the four R's of resource, uh, refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Ask yourself whether you really need it, what you're buying, and refuse packaging whenever possible. Rent, borrow, or barter goods and services when you can. Buy secondhand and donate or sell unused items, right? That's a great idea. Buy things that are reusable, recyclable, or, com or, or compostable, or compostable, and be sure to reuse, recycle, and, comp and compost them. Buy products with little or no packaging and recycle any packaging as much as possible. Avoid disposables like paper, plastic bags, paper plates, paper cups, plastic cups, uh, plastic and, 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 and uh, plastic utensils as well, disposable diapers, disposable razors, uh, whenever Try to use reusable versions if possible. Uh, like in my house, we used to use plastic, uh, excuse me, paper plates all the time. We've stopped. Uh, we've stopped. I use now just the regular plates. We put them in the dishwasher or wash them ourselves uh, because, again, those paper plates, while we are recycling some of our paper, uh, a lot of that paper is not getting recycled, especially if it has food, uh, food products on it. Uh, cook with whole fresh foods. Avoid heavily packaged processed foods uh, and buy products in bulk when possible. And discontinue junk mail as much as possible. Possible. Read online newspapers, magazines, and ebooks. All right, so here we go. I told you that we would uh, revisit that cradle to cradle idea. Uh, reuse is on the rise. Uh, the European Union, EU, has banned e waste. Remember, those there are those electronic wastes like computers and iPhones uh, from landfills and incinerators. Manufacturers are required to take back the products in Euro uh, Europe at the end of their useful lives to try to, again, repurpose and reuse the components uh, of that electronic waste. Again, that's your cradle to cradle. Don't put it in the grave. Bring those uh, 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 products, bring those uh, uh, components back to the cradle and reuse them in, in another product. Finland has banned all beverage containers that cannot be reused. Uh, rechargeable batteries uh, have also been uh, been banned. Uh, and reusable cloth bags for groceries, right, have been used. That's been a big thing uh, here, uh, taxing uh, the plastic shopping bags. I know myself, I've stopped using plastic shopping bags maybe about five, six years ago. Uh, we have the cloth bags. Now, why? A, it helps with the environment, obviously, helps with our with our solid waste, reducing that solid waste, um, not using plastic shopping bags. In addition, though, I also th I actually think the cloth bags are bigger. Uh, they're actually easier. There's actually less trips that I have to take from my uh, downstairs garage where I park my car up into my kitchen, which is on my second floor. So to me, it's a win-win, those cloth bags. Not only do we reduce our solid waste, but uh, it's also easier to carry. There's could fit more in a bag. So to me, 
uh, why aren't you using these things? I think that uh, I think that they should be used. And again, many cities have banned plastic bags and 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 uh, foam uh, food containers. Okay, so uh, many of our counties here uh, in the uh, in in New York have done this as well. Uh, and shared use neighborhood tool libraries are sharing toy libraries uh, and companies rent tools and household goods. Uh, so instead of buying them yourself and then disposing of them, uh, you can kind of rent these tools and they can be used over and over again. So again, what can you do to help uh, push forward uh, this cradle to cradle design that we want to uh, that, that we want to begin to implement? Well, buy beverages in refillable glass containers. Use reusable lunch containers. Use reusable coffee container and carry it with you. Right? Don't go to Dunkin' and get that styrofoam cup. Uh, uh, bring your own cup, bring your own uh, uh, water bottle or coffee mug and fill up the coffee uh, in there. Store refrigerated food in reusable containers. Use rechargeable batteries and recycle them when their useful life is over. When eating out, bring your own reusable container for leftovers. I mean, again, I don't know if I would do that. <laughs> I'm maybe pushing it a little bit, but obviously something that you could do. Uh, or maybe just don't have any leftovers, right? Eat all that food up. Eat all that food up when you eat out. Uh, carry groceries and other items in reusable basket, uh, baskets or cloth bags. Uh, and buy used furniture, used cars, and other items whenever possible, right? So again, just understand, have a few of these in your mind. Again, what can you do to help reuse, to help uh, to help uh, to help again push forward uh, that cradle to cradle design uh, that we need to uh, we need to begin moving towards. All right, we're now going to talk about recycling. Uh, so that was more of a reuse. Now we're going to head into recycling here and uh, a bunch of different types of recycling uh, 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 things that we're going to talk about here first. Uh, something called primary closed loop recycling. Uh, materials are recycled into, into the same type. Uh, so this would be plastic bottles being recycled into plastic. Uh, you know, um, um, let's say paper products being recycled back into paper, okay? This is called, this would be an example of a primary or a closed loop recycling when the materials are just recycled back. You recycle aluminum cans, uh, the recycled uh, product is is aluminum, right? Okay, so uh, materials are recycled into the same type. Secondary recycling is when materials are converted into other products, okay? So this would be uh, something like, let's say you, uh, you, you, uh, Let's say have have that aluminum that you uh, that you melt down, but then you uh, you turn that aluminum into something else and then use it. That would be your secondary recycling. Types of waste that can be recycled. All right, we have pre-consumer waste, which is internal waste generated in the manufacturing process. So pre-consumer, before you and I as consumers actually get the product, there is waste that is generated in the uh, manufacturing uh, process. Again, it's called pre-consumer waste, uh, and that waste could be recycled right at the manufacturing plant. Then we have the post-consumer waste, that is external waste gener generated by the product use, and that's what we deal with, okay? We are the, uh, the post-consumer waste, uh, and that's what we do when we put something in, in recycling. Again, that's, uh, that's the waste that we have as post-consumers, uh, and that's what we are we are recycling. Uh, upcycling, okay, is re its recycled form is actually more useful than the original item, okay? So that's something that can happen as well. Well, downcycling, obviously, is when the recycled form is less useful uh, than the original item. Necessary steps to recycling, you got to collect the material, you got to convert it into new products, uh, and then buying and selling products that contain recycled material would be uh, the last step there uh, of the recycling product. So collect it, convert it, and then buy or, or sell it, uh, that, that recycled uh, ma material or product uh, that you happen to make. With incentives, the United States could recycle and compost most uh, 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 about 80% of its, its municipal solid waste. Again, MSW, municipal solid waste, that's what we are producing, the, the uh, municipalities, right? Uh, normal people living uh, day to day. Uh, so with incentives, we could be up near 80%. In 2014, e-waste contained more than one-tenth of all gold mined that year. 
Think about that, all right? The waste contained about 10% of all the gold that was mined uh, is just sitting in this e-waste, in this electronic waste in some in some uh, landfill somewhere, either here in the U.S. or overseas. That's why we were talking about in the last part how you have in underdeveloped countries, you have children, adolescents who are going through these toxic waste dumps looking for e-waste because they can find the gold and then sell it and make money for their families. But unfortunately, many of them aren't getting that far because they're getting sick uh, with all the toxic chemicals that are released from these open garbage dumps that they have in, uh, in many of our uh, underdeveloped nations where a lot of this e-waste is going. Again, it's also sources of iron, copper, silver, and aluminum. Uh, composting mimics nature's recycling of nutrients, right? That's what composting is all about, taking organic matter and turning it into usable soil uh, to be used. We spoke about this in, in previous units. I think I showed you a picture. Some of you guys were able to use the soil that I create in my compost heap in my backyard for the uh, soil lab that we did earlier in the year. Uh, so again, composting, uh, another way of of recycling again and that mimics nature's way all right so we can mix or separate household solid waste for recycling so material or recovery facilities known as mrfs uh, can encourage increased trash production a mixed waste approach becoming less sustainable in many communities people throw trash in the recycling bin so again uh you know <clears throat> the idea here is to mix or separate your household solid waste like many of us do right paper we have cans, we have trash. That's happening right here in the room here uh, in, in the classroom, right? Paper uh, uh, for containers, aluminum and plastic, and another one. And then for the regular trash, I have one away, but uh, another uh, bin here. But the problem is uh, people tend to throw trash in recycling bins because they either don't care or they don't uh, take the minute or two to just read uh, what you're supposed to put in each, in each bin here. So uh, it is becoming less sustainable in many communities. Uh, source separation costs less to implement. Okay, uh, so that's something to think about. Uh, pay as you throw or fee per bag. Again, charge for garbage, uh, but not recycling. So we spoke about this in, in part one. Again, pay as you throw. What is that? As you throw it away, you pay for it. And again, fee per bag. Depending on how many bags of garbage you have, you pay for the garbage. So uh, that would uh, that's some of the incentive to recycle. Because obviously, if you're not recycling, you're just throwing it out, you're going to pay more money uh, for doing that. That doesn't necessarily happen. I know in my community that doesn't happen we pay a straight fee for garbage pickup doesn't matter if i have one bag of garbage or 1800 bags of garbage uh, i'm not going to pay any additional cost so maybe that needs to change uh, maybe we need to be charged for the garbage we throw out so that again just another incentive to recycle these products uh the cradle to cradle idea not the cradle to grave we don't want to throw them out recycling paper 55 percent of the world's industrial tree harvest used to make paper Paper, okay, think about that. Uh, could make tree free paper from straw or something called canaf. All right, so these are just other types of. Uh of, of subs or, or materials that we can use uh, to make paper not from trees. Uh, the pulp and paper industry, energy use, world's fifth largest consumer of energy. Again, this is the pulp and paper industry creating uh, uh, paper, uh, we, the world's fifth largest consumer. So again, if we can begin to recycle this stuff, not only do we not cut down as many trees, but we don't need as much energy uh, to create all this paper. So again, it's a win-win situation. Uh, obviously, water use and pollution also get thrown into uh, the pulp and paper industry. So if we are recycling more paper, we'll need to create less paper, and that should uh, decrease the water use and decrease the pollution. Uh, and again, more win-win situations uh, when it comes to recycling paper. Um, in addition, recycle paper compared with making paper from wood pulp. Again, this is just what I kind of talked about, but here are some uh, statistics for you. Generates 35% less water pollution by recycling paper rather than making it from scratch, and it generates 74% less air pollution. Uh, so again, win-win. More we recycle, the less we have to make from scratch, and therefore uh, 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 the more uh, ecological friendly uh, that our, our paper processing becomes because again, uh, be able to uh, uh, make a recycle paper generates 35% less water pollution, 74 less air pollution as compared to making paper from wood pulp, which is basically making paper from scratch, uh, making paper from those trees. 
Let's talk about recycling plastics now. Plastics composed of resins created from oil and natural gas. All right, so that, now you can almost you can almost begin to see where we're headed here, right? When it comes to it comes to plastics, all right? They're they're composed of oil and natural gas, or at least the resins left over. Currently, only seven percent by weight of these plastics is recycled in the United States. Many types of plastic resins out there. They are difficult to separate. Uh, in 2014, we had the first re uh, recyclable thermoset plastic created, so that is helping a little bit. Um, sorry about that. All right. So uh, again, just when we talk about plastics, okay, uh, only 7% by weight is recycled. Uh, we need to recycle that uh, more of that because obviously it's created from oil and natural gas. So you can obviously uh, just kind of deduce that if we can reduce the amount of plastics that need to be created, cradle, right? Now uh, we're all going to use less oil and natural gas, which is obviously uh, helpful in other realms of pollution and things like that. So again, we're learning here. Everything is interesting mixed guys in environmental science i hope you figure that out now uh, but uh, as of as of this point uh here 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 in april uh hopefully you figure that out by now and you can see this is a uh, recycling plastics just another just another point uh, uh to that interconnectedness all right so recycling has advantages but it also has some disadvantages all right so we do need to talk about that uh advantages obviously net economic health uh net e economic worth it's it's, it's cheaper health uh better for your health uh it's better for uh better for uh, environmental benefits uh but also there, it is costly so when we talk about neck net economics again if you go through that whole process that 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 that, that cost process that, that we talk about, um, at the end, the net, okay, it, it's, a, it's more economical to recycle. However, up front, it is going to be a little costly to do in, in individual cities and individual uh, um, towns and, and municipalities, okay? So again, that's kind of the disadvantage is very similar to kind of solar, right? It's the startup is expensive, but after time, all right, the net economic benefits uh, are greater when it comes to recycling, okay? Uh, single pickup system uh, and sorting recyclables by type, all right? Uh, <clears throat> these are just some things uh, that have to do with recycling. So again, advantages, disadvantages, trade-offs, all right? Recycling advantages, reduces energy and mineral use and air and water pollution, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, reduces our solid waste, disadvantages, can cost more than burying in areas with ample landfill space, reduce, uh, reduces profits for landfills and incinerator owners, uh, and it is inconvenient for some. I don't know how it could be inconvenient to, to, to recycle. I mean, you throw something in one bin, you throw something in another, but I guess for some folks, uh, it, it could be in, inconvenient to recycle. All right, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of burning or burying solid waste? So we just talked about the four R's, all right, uh, uh, refuse, reuse, uh, uh, recycle, okay. Um, uh, reuse, I'm forgetting the last one. Reuse, refuse, uh, recycle, all right, or the last one is, let's go back and make sure because I'm just drawing a blank right now and I want to make sure you guys I'll have it all here. Uh, uh, recycling, refusing, reducing. That's it. All right. Reducing our use. Okay. So we just spoke about that. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of burning or burying the solid waste. Okay. So again, as with everything, there will be some advantages. There will be some disadvantages. So technologies for burning and burying solid waste is well developed. Okay. We've been doing this for many, many years. Burning, however, can contribute to air and water pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Buried waste can contribute to water pollution. Okay. So these are some of the issues that we're going to talk about. Uh, heat released by burning trash. So first we'll talk about burning solid waste. Uh, heat released by burning trash can be used to heat water or interior spaces. So this is the waste to energy incinerators produce electricity. Uh, landfills emit more air pollutants than modern waste to energy incinerators. So again, uh, from an environmental standpoint, it seems to be a little bit better environmentally to, to incinerate, uh, to incinerate these, uh, 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 the solid waste because right now with the modern waste to energy incinerators, uh, they actually don't, even though they're burning stuff, they're not releasing as much air pollutants as just regular landfills do. Uh, however, incinerator ash does contain toxic chemicals that must be disposed of or stored up somewhere. Okay, so that's obviously a disadvantage. Uh, so here we go. This is a waste to energy incinerator with a pollution controls. Uh, again, what it does is it burns mixed solid waste for use of for, for 
steam. It creates steam, and then you can use that steam uh, to either uh, provide heat or to uh, move turbines that then produce electricity uh, that can be put out in the electrical grid. So uh, you'll notice here the waste pit. We pour the waste into the furnace. Uh, the furnace burns it. Okay, we have the boiler. Here we go. Burns it up. Then we got or be this the fire here. The burn warms the boiler where the steam goes then up into the turbine which moves to produce electricity all right and then in this boiler we have a, a wet scrubber that will take out some of the dirty water uh again some of the uh electrostatic precipitator here again just takes out uh, more of the of, of the pollution this is the pollution control okay in these uh in these modern waste to energy incinerators and then obviously there is some pollutants that get out through a smokestack all right but with this electrostatic precipitator and this scrubber here, we get a lot of the uh, a lot of the pollutants out. Obviously, you have some ash from the furnace, and you have some dirty water. That then the dirty water goes to a waste treatment plant, where it can be uh, go through the primary and secondary uh, treatment. Uh, 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 treatment processes that we talked about in the previous chapter and then obviously the bottom ash is put into a truck and then disposed of in a landfill or used as landfill cover uh, so again uh, this is kind of uh, some of the disadvantages is you're going to have some pollution you're going to have some um, you're going to have some solid waste that you're going to have to deal with uh, but a positive here is that you could produce energy with this waste uh, you can produce heat with this waste and it is a little more uh, at least at least produce, produces a little bit less uh, air pollution than just regular landfills because the modern incinerators have uh, these uh, 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 these these controls here these uh, 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 pollution controls. Okay, what we'll talk about in a little bit is, uh, or at least when you if you don't have these modern incinerators, if you're just burning the garbage without the pollution controls, then it's just as bad or even worse than than in landfills. But again, these are modern incinerators, uh, waste incinerators to energy, uh, and again, they do have that pollution control, which helps. So. Once again, our favorite slides, uh, trade-offs to a waste to energy incineration. Again, this is burning. Uh, again, you need you know the rule here. You'll need to know a few of these at least. So advantages, uh, reduces our trash volume, produces energy, concentrates hazardous substance into ash for burial. So we have it all there. We know where the toxic substance are so that we can deal with it. Uh, and the sale of energy reduces cost. Disadvantages, again, expensive to build out front, okay? So when you look over time, this will save money, but up front, uh, it's expensive to build. You do produce some hazardous waste that you have to deal with. It does emit some carbon dioxide and other air pollutions that you'll have to deal with. Uh, and it encourages waste production because in a way, if we have this easy way to burn the waste, uh, it actually encourages waste production, which is what we don't want. Okay, So uh, those are some of the disadvantages of, of burning or incinerating uh, that solid waste. Uh, here's a critical concept in the book, environmental justice. Environmental justice is the ideal uh, that all people are entitled to. Many polluting factories, hazardous waste sites, incinerators, and landfills are located in communities populated by minority groups. Uh, ana analysis argue that the ethical principle of environmental justice should carry as much weight in sitting uh, hazardous sites as an economic factor. So this is basically saying uh, when we talk about um, under underprivileged groups, we, we speak about the, the, the economics of those underprivileged groups, not having access to uh, education, not having access to good jobs, things like that. But what we don't talk about is how in a lot of these uh, under, uh, uh, a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, uh, groups, um, they don't have, we, we, we tend to put these hazardous waste sites uh, in some of these folks' communities because maybe they don't vote or maybe uh, they're just not listened to, okay, because they're underrepresented uh, uh, communities here. So again, uh, it's something to think about. Uh, the, it's this environmental justice, uh, meaning that uh, all people are entitled to have a clean environment. Uh, it doesn't matter of your eco, uh, socio, economic standing. Uh, everyone, everyone is allowed to have clean air and clean water and a, and a clean backyard to raise their families. Uh, and so again, just something to think about here, uh, this concept of environmental justice when it comes to uh, putting these incinerators, these hazardous waste sites, uh, again, in, in what communities are they going into?
All right, last stuff for this uh, for this part two, we're going to talk about burying solid waste. All right, so we just talked about burning it, incineration. Now we'll talk about burying, and again, advantages and disadvantages. So sanitary landfills, all right, they are compacted layers of waste between clay or foam. Why? Why do we put it between clay? You guys, hopefully, uh, with that groundwater lab we did uh, in the last chapter, understand uh, that the clay is a confining layer. Clay is not permeable, right? Also, we did the soil test at the beginning of the year where we tried that clay. If it's, it's, the permeability is very low, so water really has a hard time getting through it. So you want to put these compacted layers of waste between the clay or the foam because that traps the waste in there. And then if any water seeps in uh, and, and, and gets uh, contaminated, right? It has a harder time getting out. Bottom liners and contaminant systems collect leaching liquids. So basically in the sanitary landfills, then at the bottom, you have some kind of liner so that if you do get some seepage down or some leaching liquids, it then stop, collects them there. Uh, and actually uh, some of these sanitary landfills even have a collection or a method uh, for collecting the methane uh, that, that is released when you have, uh, again, the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, bacteria uh, and the smaller uh, cellular type of uh, organisms uh, decomposing. Okay, uh, that uh, that that solid waste. Uh, the byproduct is methane, and some of these sanitary landfills actually have a method for collecting the methane. So again, these are advantages. Okay, uh, if you have a sanitary landfill, uh, it really can keep uh, any pollutants, any toxic chemicals right there in the landfill, and you don't have to deal with a lot of the issues uh, of, of 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 contamination. Uh, types of waste that are placed into landfills, paper, yard waste, plastic, metals, wood, glass, and food waste. All right. So again, uh, here's just kind of a picture of what we're looking at here. And again, new landfills uh, um, reduce the problems that old landfills had. So you'll notice here, all right, uh, what we got going here is here is your compacted solid waste, right? Uh, on top, you got topsoil, sand, and clay to kind of keep the solid waste uh, down there, right? And not allow uh, any rainwater to percolate or to infiltrate down into the compacted waste. If you do get some, well, there we have those bottom liners with, 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 actual, uh, with actual pipes here that can that can clean out that that water okay and not allow it to seep into groundwater polluting our groundwater and then you'll notice here you can we can pump it up to a a, a, a storage tank where that leached water is 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 held and then can actually go into a treatment system to actually clean out that to clean out that water you'll notice here is the methane recovery well here that actually recovers the methane and actually uses it to generate fuel right to generate electricity so you can actually use the methane to generate electricity electricity. And then they have these uh, groundwater monitoring wells that actually make sure the groundwater is staying clean here, is not getting contaminated. And if uh, they do sense any of these leaks, either in the methane or in the uh, or in the leaching material, then they can quickly uh, deal with that problem. So again, this is a sanitary landfill. This is uh, uh, these newer ones that honestly, it, it, you have an advantage if you can bury your waste here. The, 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 it really keeps the toxic chemicals confined and it actually uses any of those to, uh, you know, we can treat out the, the, uh, any, any water that is contaminated and the methane we can actually use to, uh, to produce electricity. Uh, so again, good things happen here. Unfortunately, in our underdeveloped countries, they don't have landfills that look like this. Uh, landfills are basically just areas they just dump waste, all right? And so obviously in underdeveloped nations and, and, and potentially in some minority communities, even in developed nations. This is that uh, environmental justice we talk about. Uh, they might not have a uh, sanitary landfill with all these bells and whistles uh, to help collect and to help deal with any uh, possible pollution. All right, so again, here you go, trade-offs, okay, between your sanitary landfills, uh, advantages, disadvantages, all right, advantages, low operating costs, can handle large amounts of waste, filled land can be used for other purposes. No shortage of landfill space in many areas. Disadvantages, noise, traffic, and dust. Where's the traffic coming from? Obviously, the dump trucks or the garbage trucks bringing the garbage in. Releases greenhouse gases, methane and carbon dioxide, unless they are collected. Output approach that encourages waste production. So again, we have all this. So it says, uh, it says, bring in your waste, bring it on in. So it actually encourages that waste production and eventually leaks and can contaminate groundwater because at the end of the day, a lot of those systems put in place to clutch the groundwater after 50, 100 years uh, may actually break down a bit. Uh, and so eventually uh, you get these leaks that can contaminate the groundwater. So again, 
advantages, disadvantages, you know the routine, just know a few. All right. Again, these open dumps, widely used in less developed countries, even an, even an, uh, just an open field or a large pit. And again, open dump is not a sanitary dump. It's just that. It's open. All right. There's nothing there to protect groundwater from being contaminated. There's nothing there to catch any methane or other uh, uh, toxic pollutants that are being released. It's just open. Okay. And so obviously this is a huge disadvantage when we talk about burying solid waste. And again, many of our underdeveloped countries, uh, this is unfortunately what they're dealing with. And here you go, guys, this is uh, open dumps in many underdeveloped countries. How are they, how do they deal with it when it gets too full? They burn it. Okay, but you'll notice here there's not those pollution control mechanisms that we saw in the modern incinerator plants uh, in, in, in that we have in many of our developed countries, right? They just set this thing on fire and let it burn. Uh, and you can only imagine the amount of pollution uh, that is being released and the amount of toxic chemicals that are being released into the, into the uh, atmosphere by burning the garbage left in an open pit or an open garbage dump, all right? So this, we do not need to see this. Uh, this we need to do it way with. Okay. All right. So how should we deal with hazardous waste? Uh, that will be the uh, beginning of our next uh, part, part three. So this is the end of part two, and I will see you again for part three.